Okay, so I hope the slides are visible to you guys. Well, boleh basically nampak. today, boleh nampak? Boleh, boleh. Okay. So basically today we are going to finish um, chapter 3. Yeah? And, um, probably today we are going to start with chapter 4 as well. Right, so before we continue what we have um, learned last week, Probably just a bit of recap what we have learned so far. I think um, last week we have started with um, the types of corrosion. Okay, so we have a few um, types of corrosion from general corrosion, and then goes to uh, localized corrosion. Okay. And for localized corrosion, we can categorize into a few subtypes. Like for example, pitting corrosion. Crevice corrosion, galvanic corrosion, intergranular corrosion, selective corrosion, and finally filiform corrosion. You also have combined effect of corrosion, which probably on the mechanical factors and also the corrosion itself. So we have stress corrosion, also have uh, corrosion fatigue, erosion corrosion, and fretting corrosion. Things that you need to remember is that for stress corrosion, uh, to make it different with corrosion fatigue, the types of stress applied for stress corrosion or stress corrosion cracking, SCC, is probably on the static stress applied to the material. And while for fatigue corrosion, it will be a different um, stress, amount of stress applied to the material. And other than that, we also have microbiological corrosion. Okay. Microbiological corrosion is uh, types of corrosion produced by uh, bacteria. Okay. So bacteria actually um, induce the metal and uh, triggers the corrosion process. And we also have started looking at uh, the types of corrosion controls. So we have five major methods. We have gone through material selection, okay? and then uh, we also have gone through the modifying the environment by controlling the environment and also by the use of corrosion inhibitors. So as I said, uh, corrosion inhibitors is basically uh, a chemical compound that is added um, with a small uh, volume, uh, a small concentration that basically reduce the corrosion rate. And as what I have shared last week to your guests, there's a few uh, corrosion inhibitors criteria, which probably we look at uh, the compound must be an electron rich compound with uh, heteroatom functionalities, for example, with the content of nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Apart from that, if uh, the structure contains uh, pi bond, all these are actually uh, electron rich. Uh, functionalities, lawn pair, all this can um, integrate uh, into the um, contribution for uh, adsorption formation. So we have uh, different modes of um, adsorption that uh, can be contribute from the inhibitor. So we can have like desorption. This is where the electrostatic interaction between the charge uh, molecules of inhibitors with uh, another charge of um, a counter charge of uh, metal surface. We also have uh, chemical absorption. This is actually due to the sharing of electrons from the electron rich functionalities with the electron poor uh, metal uh, orbitals. So this will create an interaction, form a bonding, and this is also known as chemical absorption. Right, so for today, we are going to continue with uh, types of um, coatings. Eh? So coatings or protective coating can be categorized as part of um, corrosion protection techniques. Okay? Uh, the reason why we include um, or introduce coating is because coating can basically uh, produce an isolated environment uh, between the metals and also the uh, corrosive environment. Right, so we have 
a coating or covering with a noble metal or a better corrosion resistant properties and also we do have non-metallic coatings okay? so um, for coatings we have like the first one uh, metallic coating and uh, non-metallic coatings right so as i said coatings actually create a barrier okay between uh, metals to uh, electronite and we do have like a different uh, types of coating we have like uh, metallic coating and non-metallic coating metallic coating can be uh, from electro deposition okay, electroplating okay. and then for non-metallic we can have like inorganic and organic coating so for inorganic normally it will be for uh, the use of cement eh? cement concrete okay and then for organic coating this the widely used we use a polymer based coating like for example paint okay right so for metallic coating normally we will coat the metals with a more noble metals in this case if you use uh, iron you can coat it with uh, copper for example to make it more resistant or you can also coat it with another metals like chromium nickel or tin okay. so for example we have like coating of zinc in galvanized steel coating of tin in iron containers so all these are actually um, part of the uh, techniques in metal coating normally this uh, happen with the help of electro deposition or electro plating. For non-metallic coatings, uh, it can be uh, by introducing a very high resistance into the corrosion cell circuit and drastically reduce the flow of electrons. So the barrier uh, touch coating could uh, will actually protect the metals as long as there's no crack. And if a crack occurs, Corrosion becomes intense at the surface metal. This will result in localized corrosion or pitting corrosion. Resistant types of coating include additive that break down in the presence of water and oxygen to, into inhibiting agents. So for inorganic coating, we have a few examples like uh, concrete, uh, silica, and ceramics. Okay. Cement is also can be uh, categorized as um, inorganic coating because if you see uh, in the building, eh, you have like uh, reinforced steel. Eh? In the wall, eh, you have like reinforced steel. So this reinforced steel is actually important to ensure that the structure of um, uh, the building can uh, long lasting. And then uh, when you put the cement and everything, it will actually uh, protect the uh, walls eh, from corroded. So uh yeah when you put the cement the only problem is because uh concrete or cement sometimes uh it can be porous eh? so when it become porous uh they still have some tendency for uh, water and hydrogen absorption So when it dissolves, uh, corrosion still can occur. I mean, for the enforced steel. The types of organic coating it can be categorized by the use of tar, paint, plastic, and etc. So paint coatings are considered the most practical and economical means for the corrosion protection. So the several mechanisms by which paint coating system provides corrosion protection is due to the fact that it will create a barrier. As I said. Um, for coatings, eh? 
uh, it will limit the access of chemical species. In this case, um, we are talking about water and also oxygen involved in electrochemical corrosion reaction. Okay. A barrier also maintaining a high electrical resistance at the substrate interference interface, restricting the access of ionic species. Okay. And then uh, coatings also sometimes include inhibitors where the inhibitors in the primer will passivate the underlying metal surface. And some paint also contains metals eh, like epoxy, uh, zinc ribs. Okay. Uh, you will see a lot. I mean, if you go to any hardware shop, uh, if you buy and say like, I want to buy a uh, zinc chromate uh, paint, it is basically epoxy paint uh, because epoxy is basically the polymer and then uh, zinc chromate is basically the, um, the cathodic protection and also the inhibitor because the chromate actually will provide the passivity. So uh, the function of cathodic protection uh, in pain, like for example zinc, eh? so when you apply epoxy zinc rich uh, coating into metal, for example iron, this will create a so-called galvanic effect. So what happens is that the zinc that uh, contains in your pain will be corroded compared to your iron. Doctor? Yes. Excuse me, can you accept uh, Jihad because he, he called me, he said, if you tell Dr. Haza, I want to accept me. Oh, I say, okay, right. Um, Thank very you so sorry, much. I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah, probably jihad is already here. Okay, right. So in pain, uh, there's a few components that you need to consider. If you want to produce your own pain, eh, perhaps later on, uh, once you graduated and you want to start a coating industry, there's a few consideration that you need to uh, take into account when you want to make the formulation. The first one is basically in coatings, normally you should add binders. So binders will always going to be polymers. Okay. So that is why most of the coatings you will see it is made from polymer, like resin. Okay, uh, you can also have like uh, polyvinyl, eh? polyurethane, epoxy, alkyd, uh, resol, uh, what else, uh, and other things. So all these are actually a polymer-based thing because when you include polymer, this will actually make the surface long-lasting. Okay? And binders also will have like uh, plasticizing or plasticizers uh, properties. It's like a plastic, you apply a, a plastic on the surface. Okay, apart from that, you will need a solvent, okay? Because this, this solvent will basically uh, dissolve the polymer. So uh, some of the solvent used in pain could be like toluene, okay, uh, xylene, okay? And you can also have like ketone-based um, solvent, eh? like MIBK. Methyl, ethyl, uh, methyl isobutyl ketone. Okay, they also have MEK. Okay, methyl ethyl ketone. All these are actually ketone based solvent. Okay, you can also use other things like uh, spirit. Eh? Spirit. Eh? So, spirit is basically a mixture of um, alcohol and also chloroform. Okay. Um, not sure why it suddenly becomes not responding. But in pain also, we can all introduce pigments eh, or coloring. So the types of pigment that normally introduced in pain will be uh, titanium dioxide, eh, TiO2. The reason why pigment is included in coating is because um, titanium oxide or pigment can actually uh, mix the ingredient together. That is actually the function of pigment. 
Okay. So far, is there any question that you want to ask? Anything about pain? Uh, doctor, I would like to ask. Mm, yeah. Uh, so, doctor, you said just now the pigment is the like a uh, mix the ingredient together. What about the binder? Does, doesn't that mean that the binder usually going to mix mm -hmm. all that together? Okay. Binder actually binds. Uh, if you look uh, on the name itself, it actually binds. It's like uh, trying to like um, like uh, uh, not see uh, interact with each other. It's like a, a glue. Eh? Uh, a binder is more uh, more or less function like a glue. Pigment, meanwhile, is actually function to um, as a dispersion. It's like uh, if you have like inorganic materials, for example, if you have an additive, you are not sure whether the additive uh, will be miscible with your polymer or with other ingredients. That is why we need pigment uh, agent because uh, pigment agent is uh, more or less will um, uh, interact and uh, form a better, uh, I mean, uh, interaction between the binder, polymer, and also other things. Binder itself is like a glue. It's you you uh, put all together. But if you put inorganic materials, maybe that inorganic materials not going to be dissolved in um, glue in your binder or whatnot. So that is why we need uh, pigment agent. And sometimes uh, this pigment also have a coloring uh, property because like okay, the color itself is like white, eh? white in color. Uh, some pigment uh, or some uh, colorant, uh, when you put it's just uh, first the purpose is you want to make it uh, a different color, but at the same time, you want to improve in terms of the uh, dispersion of uh, all particulates in your paint. Then um, I think some special amount or specific amounts of uh, pigment need to be introduced. Okay. And then apart from that, in pain also, uh, people will put additive like anti-corrosive. Um, this is where uh, inhibitor corrosion inhibitor will be put inside, and then uh, antifungal, okay, antifungal pain actually uh, will give a, a properties where uh, like mold or any types of um, fungal can cannot grow. Because it has uh, so called like a toxic, slightly toxic properties. Okay? So, what would be the examples of antifungal? Normally, they will put uh, metal complex, eh? metal complexes. Okay? For example, uh, copper uh, with um, what is it called? Uh, that ligand, omadine. Copper omadine, uh, zinc omadine, but normally copper will be used because copper have uh, slightly toxic properties. But I think these days people have less used copper because of its um, leaching properties and uh, very toxic. And they actually substitute with other types of metal like uh, iron omadine, uh, zinc omadine, or other. But it must be a, a metal complex that give antifungal properties. Apart from that. Um, we can also have uh, anti-fouling. Eh? Okay, anti-fouling means that if you notice, eh, uh, in marine, uh, for example, ships, eh, you'll notice that there's a binacles. Eh? Uh, in Malay, we call it asterite. Have you ever go to? Uh, I'm not good in drawing ship. Eh? Maybe like this one. This one is a ship. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you will notice that uh, there's a marine life that is attached on the wall, not only to the ship wall. Eh? If you go to uh, sea, uh, if you found any rocks, eh, uh, you will see this uh, creature a lot. Eh? Uh, it will be detached on the surface of the rock and it is very hard to be removed. Normally, they will have to use a water jet okay, to remove or they have to use a polisher or grinder 
to skim off okay, the barnacles. So that is why some uh, people, they will prefer anticholine because when you apply the types of pain, uh, it will actually prevent the attachment of uh, pollen like uh, barnacles or any types of shells. Okay, All right. And to your surprise, some pains also have a specific uh, properties like anti-mosquito pain. Uh, ever heard about anti-mosquito pain? No. But uh, what do you think the uh, active ingredient in producing anti-mosquito pain? Anyone have some idea? Maybe if you know some something uh, regarding on this. Pernah dengar Aliana? Tak pernah rata. <laughs> okay. Uh, basically, anti-mosquito pain, uh, they will add a special essential oil. Uh, the types of essential oil used, uh, EO, uh, used for anti-mosquito, normally they will put uh, citronella. Eh? Citronella. Anyone knows what does it, I mean, what is citronella? Citronella is basically a lemongrass essence. Eh? Lemongrass. Uh, in Malay, lemongrass is serai. Lah. Okay, pokok serai. So when uh, actually you extract citronella from lemongrass, it will produce an essential oil. And this essential oil actually will produce like a voltaic compound or uh, it will emit a gas that normally mosquito didn't like it. So it actually behaves more or less like a mosquito repellent uh, than, uh, I mean, as a pesticide. Right? Because like, uh, like pesticide, it will kill the mosquito. But uh, this could be harmful to human beings as well. But uh, mosquito repellent, it means that it will repel. It will just chase the mosquito away. At the same time, it will produce like uh, a very aromatic uh, fragrance to people. All right. And the concept of pain, basically, uh, you will notice that to produce a very good type of coating, you need to apply primer. Okay. And then after that, you will apply decorative or top coat paint. Okay. So primer, what is actually the uh, function of primer? It will actually produce, I mean, uh, give a good adhesion. Okay. So that is why if you see people uh, applying paint eh, on the wall, they will first put emulsion paint. Eh? Emulsion paint is more or less like a primer, eh? wash primer. The white paint, eh? the emulsion paint, white paint, kita cakap cap putih. Applied to the wall or the first layer is actually to improve the uh, adhesion because later on when you apply like a glossy uh, top coat or what then this uh, will give you a better uh, or more homogeneous otherwise if you just apply the paint uh, to the wall or to the surface what happens is if the metals of or the uh, wall is actually porous it will absorb and you will see that it will form patches eh? it will form like a patches and your uh, coating, um, I mean, layer is not going to be smooth. Okay, all right. So apart from that, um, some also apply different layers, like they apply anti-rust, eh, intermediates, and also top coats. Of course, the anti-corrosive uh, paint or anti-rust will give a corrosion protection. This is more or less uh, where the um, uh, metal-rich paint being applied. Intermediate is normally to thicken the pin layer, okay. normally just epoxy layer. Okay. And then you can have also decorative or top coats where you can have like anti polling, okay. uh, you can also have uh, other types of uh, pin features. Right. So we are moving on to the fourth technique, which is on uh, induced current techniques. Eh? So in induced current techniques, we can have 
uh, cathodic protection and also anodic protection. Okay. In fact, in uh, cathodic protection, we can also have ICCP and also a normal CP. Okay. Right. So what does it mean by cathodic protection and anodic protection? So we go one by one first. Cathodic protection, okay, it means that metal to be protect will be cathode. Okay. In this case, imagine that if you have uh, iron. Oops. And you want to protect this iron. Maybe you are not going to apply coating or whatnot. Maybe because of budget or what. Or maybe because of the structure. It is uh, been buried underground. Eh? This is normally for pipes. Eh? And you want to protect your iron. So what you do? Because you know if you put iron by itself, it will corrode. So the concept is basically you make like a, a galvanic cell. You attach with a more active metal. More active metal will become anode. In this case, if I pair it with magnesium, okay, so you know now magnesium will be anode and Iron will be cathode. So iron will be reduced and it will not oxidize. So this part of the techniques to uh, prevent your structure from corrosion. And the method is known as cathodic protection. And the more active metal being paired to your structure is known as sacrificial anode. Sacrificial anode. It sacrifices itself, and this material need a continuous replacement. Continuous replacement. Okay, so from time to time, you need to replace, and you have to make sure that the sacrificial anode must be cheap. Okay? Right. So as I said, cathodic protection is the techniques to control the corrosion of metal surface by making that surface become cathodic to the surface or to the environment of the uh, or the cathode or the cell, corrosion cell. Cathodic protection can be achieved in two ways. Of course, the first one, you need to connect with a more anodic metal. Okay? And it must also pass an electrical DC current. Okay, then only uh, this system can occur. Meaning that the two electrodes need to be connected together. Otherwise, cathodic protection cannot be achieved. Right. So, gas protection is the uh, effect that we have seen just now. When you actually pair it to a more active metal, uh, the materials that have uh, more active properties will become sacrificial anodes. Okay. A uh, type of um, example for sacrificial anode can be aluminium, zinc, and also magnesium because all this metal is basically cheap in cost. Okay. So this is also part of the consideration that you need to, to think. Cost is less. Okay. And this is actually part of the um, diagram to show you how cathodic protection works. So you have like a buried steel pipes, okay, then uh, connected with a magnesium sacrificial uh, anode of magnesium. Okay, there's also another drawing showing you how uh, the iron storage tank is protected with sacrificial magnesium anode 
Okay. And we are moving on to the next part, which is actually ICCP, uh, Impress Current Catholic Protection. So all the while we are talking about Catholic Protection alone. Okay. And if you notice, okay, there is no uh, current or probably uh, external supply apply on the system, which in this case, cathodic protection can only be applied to a smaller area. Okay. Can only be applied okay. on small area. If the area is bigger, okay, because maybe you are covering a few kilometers of pipe eh, or a few meters of pipe, then you will need ICCP. So ICCP actually apply the same concept as category protection, except that uh, it will use a rectifier. So this rectifier is basically function as the external source okay to push okay the electrons further okay so that is why iccp uh, technique is close for a bigger coverage area okay the same concept you still need the sacrificial anode but the thing is, you need a rectifier or cathodic protection control unit. This actually, as I, as I said, to push. Okay. The current or the electron further. Okay. So that it can cover a bigger area of uh, protection. Right. Any questions so far for cathodic protection? No, doctor. All right. No, doctor. We are moving on to um, anodic protection. So since we are talking about uh, cathodic protection, method to be protected become uh, what about if you're working at the extreme condition? Eh? Okay. Uh, extreme condition uh, means that probably your condition is highly acidic or busy. Example, if you imagine you are working in paper industry, So in paper industries, what they do, they actually wanted to produce paper from tree, and then they will uh, cut the tree and make it into a small wood, and then they will do bleaching eh, to produce pulp, and when you get pulp, um, you will produce paper. But in the bleaching process or in the pulping process, normally it will use a very alkaline solution. So all this process actually take into place in still reactor so you uh, imagine that oh okay if the process is very much alkaline or acidic then the reactor have a tendency to corrode so what will be the consideration in this case anodic protection will be used in this case uh, as i said um, for anodic protection metal to be protected will become you know Okay, so how does uh, anodic protection works? So as I said, in um, highly basic or acidic condition, what will happen is that your metal will be oxidized. Initially, yeah. 
and then when it oxidizes initially, it will form a passive layer or so called metal oxide. And this passive layer is basically stable okay? and it forms on anode. So when you have a passive layer, the passivation actually prevents corrosion to occur. In circumstances where cathodic protection is not practical, okay, not practical because of a strong alkaline or acidic environments, anodic protection is a useful corrosion control technique, specifically in metal environment condition where active passive behavior is demonstrated. Anodic protection is usually effective. In practice, the metal environment potential is held in the passive region by polarizing the structure in the electropositive direction where the passive layer is most stable. Historically, anodic protection has the widest application in process industry, in particular mild or stainless steel equipment used in concentrated sulfuric acid storage. Equipment such as pulp and paper mill digester and recaustization of um, white, green and black liquor. Okay. Can I revise the um, storage tank and have been also effectively protected. So here the metal potential is shifted to the positive, uh, to the passive zone, eh, which is more positive. Eh? We are going to learn about this diagram later on. Eh? Uh, more positive zone from the active region by the application of a direct current. Okay. So as I said, in this technique, the metal will be Corroded eh? uh, initially just slightly until it forms a passive layer. Okay, so when it forms a passive layer, what happens is it become chemically resistant and it will for, I mean um, prevent from further oxidation or whatnot. Okay. In comparison, the cathodic protection uh, have its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. So we are comparing between cathodic and uh, anodic protection. The advantages, it can be used for all metals and the installation cost is low. Meanwhile, the limitation, it can only be used in a weak or moderate environment. So it cannot be operated in a extreme condition like acidic or very much alkaline condition. Meanwhile, for anodic protection, the advantages is it can be used in extreme aggressive environment Okay. Operation condition can be easily controlled and it is low cost. Meanwhile, the limitation is only applicable to active passive material and the installation cost is high. Operation is cheap, but installation is expensive. So it has a pro and cons. Normally, people would prefer more on cathodic protection as compared to anodic protection. Especially cathodic protection will work best for uh, oil and gas pipelines um, and underground pipes. Okay. Meanwhile, for energy protection, it's only for chemical treatment uh, or chemical related uh, industries only. Okay, any questions so far for cathodic and uh, anode protection before uh, we move on to the last uh, last part? Uh, doctor, yeah, I would like to ask, uh, but it could be on the pin side. Uh, pin okay, part. uh, does WD 40 is a pin? <laughs> WD 40, okay, this is a very interesting um, question. Eh? Okay, WD 40 actually not function as a uh, pin eh? or coating. Reason why is because, um, WD-40 ingredient, eh? I will reveal what is actually the main ingredient inside WD-40. It actually contains hydrocarbon, pentane, uh, normally propane, normally propane or uh, pentane, uh, together with fish oil. 
So fish oil, uh, it has a slightly uh, lubricative uh, properties that uh, normally if you apply, so that is why when you have like a corroded uh, chain or corroded um, lever, you spray WD-40 and it will actually loosen up the uh, the, 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 tight, the, uh. the tight bond lah, or the, the extraction. Okay. So mm -hmm. it is not actually function as a coating, but more or less function like a lubricant. This mm -hmm. principle is almost the same if you apply oil, eh? cooking oil or anything to a, a chain or something. So uh, completely different concept as uh, paint because Pain normally or coating will be a permanent uh, layer form. But okay. WD-40 uh, will be like um, a temporary because it can be washed out um, by solvent or by anything. Um, another thing that I just want to share my own experience. Eh? Um, I'm working a lot with uh, corrosion protection and we actually produce our own uh, rust removal. So WD-40 also function as a rust remo removal because um, when they actually apply to um, corroded surface, it can slightly uh, remove out the rust. Okay. But what would be the best ingredient to uh, make a good rust removal? If you notice, or even if you go to YouTube, you just watch paint, I mean, homemade rust removal. They actually use a very simple ingredient. Okay. Uh, this is actually off the topic, lah, but just <laughs> to share with you. Rust removal. You can actually produce by yourself. Okay. What they use is actually, they use acidic, uh, they use acid, lah, organic acid normally. Like lime. Lime is the best organic acid that you can find in market or what. Um, some people also they use um, other types of um, organic acid like boric acid <coughs> or post, I mean uh, oxalate acid. Uh, all these are actually uh, organic acid that uh, that is considered as a weak acid, not really strong acid because we still need uh, slightly acidic properties to remove the rust, but not a strong one. Eh? Because if you use a strong acid like hydrochloric acid, uh, sulfuric acid or what, then it will like remove the rust, but in the same time, it will eat the, uh, the metal. It will make uh, corrosion even uh, terrible. Eh? And apart from that, uh, apart from organic acid, they also use baking soda. Okay. So the function of a baking soda is to dissolve uh, some of metal oxide. Okay. Uh, and uh, the rest will be like uh, vinegar. I mean, uh, uh, vinegar is also like organic acid uh, that you can use. Lime, vinegar, and uh, probably water. So if you have all these ingredients, you can actually make your own rice removal. But to make it either a strong rust removal or a weak rust removal, it all depends on the concentration of your acid. If your concentration of acid is slightly high, not really low, to dilute or what, then uh, your rust removal can function well. Okay, uh, But if you make it too dilute, then it will take longer time for the metal to, uh, or for the rust to remove. So uh, maybe after this, you can try to produce your own. Uh, just mix vinegar, okay? Uh, but don't use um, cooking vinegar eh? because the cooking vinegar, or in Malay, we call it cukur makan. Uh, cooking vinegar that people use in making pickles or what, all these are actually been diluted. So it's not really effective. Uh, maybe if you put like cooking vinegar, then uh, it will take some time. If you put like... Uh, Apple cider vinegar, uh, probably it can work because apple cider vinegar is slightly uh, less dilute. Okay, then it can give this uh, rust removal properties. No? Okay, baking soda you can find it elsewhere. Okay, and uh, just water. All right, 
Um, moving on to the last part eh, um, for the corrosion control is a proper design. I believe this part is very simple. The concept is if you make a proper design without um, having a, a sharp turn eh, like this, this will ensure that uh, there will be less erosion. Okay, so when you have a less erosion, okay, then corrosion can be uh, reduced as well. So design awareness and the life cycle, uh, this will give a good control of corrosion that requires the awareness and cooperation of the entire design team, including the engineers and designers, not only in each uh, specialized discipline, but in project management and cost control. Adequate means for code uh, collection, uh, reporting, and also recording corrosion information from the operation situation must also be planned. Okay, so as I said, um, in designing the materials, you if uh, you can make a design that uh, it doesn't produce like a water accumulation over here, because this is actually a poor design, uh, then you have water. Uh, Accumulation, then it can trigger corrosion. But if you like uh, make a design that no water accumulation, then this will be more preferable. Other than that, like this one, uh, you have like uh, uh, a recommended uh, design of pipes. Like this one, not uh, 90 degree elbow. Uh, you make a slightly around. Uh, turn, then this will actually reduce erosion. A recommended design of tank, uh, no accumulation of uh, deposits or sediment on bottom, that can also trigger corrosion. Okay. And that's it. I think uh, minimizing or preventing corrosion is more or less uh, by looking at the use of more corrosion resistant material. This is for material selection. You can actually call or prevent corrosion by removing aggressive species from environment. This is basically on modifying the environment. Adding corrosion inhibitors is also part of the techniques. Separating the environment between metals to, uh, to the surface is also uh, part of the techniques, okay? which in this case by applying coatings. Okay, and other than that, will be on uh, the design eh? or in this current techniques. So I believe uh, in this topic, we already cover up uh, the main um, controlling types, uh, corrosion control type. So as I said, all these uh, techniques, eh? uh, the five techniques need to be remembered because normally during exams or tests, I will always ask at least one question, the definition of each technique and what will be the concept, how you can actually uh, apply these uh, methods for corrosion protection. Okay, any questions so far for chapter three before we move on to chapter four so far? Jihad, how are you? How are you, doctor? Okay, good, very good. Any questions so far, Jihad? No, no problem. Okay. Okay. So if there's no question on chapter three, then we can move on to chapter four. I will uh, share slides for chapter four. And on Thursday, we are going to have a, a quiz. Okay, so the quiz will be uh, on the techniques eh, of uh, corrosion protection. Okay. All right. So the next chapter is basically on the corrosion, electrochemical reaction, and also kinetics. So when we talk about reaction and kinetic, this, I mean, always related with um, the activation, how the rate of uh, chemical reaction occurs. 
So we are going to address a lot of equation over here. I mean, uh, how to, I mean, um, derive butler bomber equation because butler bomber equation is an important equation that you need to memorize how to derive. But normally, uh, question been asked like how you can get butler bomber, how to derive butler bomber, how to derive Tepper slope equation, and uh, other things. Okay, so things that we are going to look in this chapter is probably on the rate of chemical reaction, rate of electrochemical reaction, charge transfer potential, which in this case we are going to look at active polarization. What does it mean by polarization and over potential? butler bomber equation, concentration polarization, combined polarization, and also mixed potential theory. Okay, so things that we already know, corrosion is a spontaneous process. Okay. Mostly electrochemical in nature, free energy is released in the process. That is why the delta G will be negative. Metal will return to its stable state, meaning that pure metal will become metal oxide. And the driving force for corrosion reaction is, of course, the chemical energy, where the energy is stored in chemical bonds of a substance. Free energy. Free energy is the portion of internal energy available for corrosion reaction to occur. For corrosion to occur, the delta G of corrosion must be negative. As I said, the process will release a free energy. And when you have a release of free energy, it is always going to be negative. So the potential pH diagram or so-called Povich diagram that we have seen earlier provides no kinetic information whatsoever. It defines the thermodynamic boundaries for important corrosion species and reaction. Corrosion rate depends primarily on the factors relating to the electrochemical reaction. In this case, relate to the temperature, electro material, surface area, and also the environment. Electrokinetic is used to predict the corrosion rate for the actual condition. This is basically a normal rate of chemical reaction. You have a product, okay, plus something that forms, oh, sorry, you have a reactant, okay, this is basically your reactant. and form a product. The same concept applies to corrosion. Okay? In this case, you have iron plus with oxygen plus with water. What happens is that it will form rust. Okay? So you have a reactant to a product. And of course, there will be a forward reaction and also a reverse reaction. Forward reaction is always related to oxidation process. And reverse reaction is always related with reduction process. Okay. So if I write the rate of forward reaction, it will going to be like this. RF or the forward rate is equal to Kf okay, multiply with the reactant. So for the forward reaction, everything going to be dependent on the reactant. And for a reverse reaction, everything will be dependent on the, I mean, the concentration of your product. At equilibrium, where forward reaction is equal to reverse reaction, then you are going to have this. Kf A multiply with B equals to Kr C multiply with D. And at the end, if you rearrange this, you will have a forward rate over a reverse rate, which at the end, it will become equilibrium constant. KEQ. This is actually KEQ. Where K is actually the equilibrium constant at particular temperature, the value of K will increase or decrease with increase in temperature depending on the variation of delta G with temperature as given by this formula. 
delta G is equal to negative RT ln K. For a molecule to react its kinetic energy, and that temperature must be sufficiently greater than the average kinetic energy to enable it to climb to the top of the energy barrier or the activation energy. Okay. As I said earlier, in the energy diagram, you have a reactant and you have a product. In order for the reactant to form a product, it needs to overcome a specific energy. Okay. So this, we call it as Ea, or some people also know it as delta G asterisk. Uh, this is actually different as this one. Huh? Delta G asterisk and also delta G. Not or delta G. Because delta G is actually the free energy, eh? the overall energy release. Meanwhile, delta G asterisk is basically the activation energy. Uh, people normally, if you say delta G asterisk, maybe you are a bit blur. But when I say EA or activation energy, maybe you know. EA and delta G asterisk is actually the same thing. It's just the notation. How do you, I mean, like, because we just want to use delta G, so we are not going to use like EA in this case. The transition state theory says that the reverse process is possible, but occurs at a much reduced rate in which the activation energy has been increased from delta G asterisk to delta G asterisk plus the free energy. As I said earlier, okay, you have the activation energy that is needed. Okay, this is the minimum energy needed to overcome. Okay, and then if you want to reverse the process, because this is the reactant to product, if you want to reverse from product to reactant, okay, the amount of energy required will be equals to delta G plus with delta G S3. Then only you will get reactant back. Okay? Is in the case of if you want to have a reverse reaction. The tendency to corrode is determined by the free energy difference okay, between the metal and its corrosion product. Delta G asterisk is the minimum amount of energy required to drive the molecules of atom over the activation energy barrier so that a principle reaction can be take place. All interaction between elements and compounds are governed by the free energy changes available to them. For spontaneous transition from free energy, okay, the initial step, okay, to a low energy or final state, the free energy changes will become delta G equals to final uh, energy or low energy minus with initial energy or high energy. And that is why you will get a negative value. So for a spontaneous reaction to occur, delta G must be negative. Right. The rate constant to be related to the size of the free energy barrier. Okay. Rate constant, as you know, is equals to A exponent minus delta G asterisk over RT. The rate of forward chemical reaction okay, is equals to RF equals to KF multiplied with reactant. Then, if you substitute the rate constant into the forward reaction, then you will get RF is equals to A exponent minus delta G asterisk over RT multiplied with reactant where A and R are constant and T is actually absolute temperature. Inception, inspection of the equation uh, shows that as the temperature increases, so also does the rate constant. But when the size of barrier, or known as activation energy, is increased, the rate constant will be decreased. The smaller the activation energy of reaction, the more rapid the reaction at the given temperature. So, uh, in this case, you always remember the difference between uh, this and this. Okay. 
So this one, it means that you have higher activation energy or higher energy as compared to this one. A lower activation energy actually give a higher rate. Okay, because you see that it is easily to overcome. Okay, easy to overcome. Then the conversion from reactant to product could be faster. Okay, so this is actually what it means by the last point. Okay, so the rate of electrochemical reaction, this is actually what we have seen. Mm, in the uh, previous chapter eh, on the electrochemical reaction. An electrochemical reaction is the reaction involving the transfer of charge as a part of chemical reaction. Typical electrochemical reaction in corrosion are metal dissolution and also oxygen reduction. This is what we know. Okay? Metal dissolution will be the anode reaction and uh, oxygen reduction is the cathodic reaction. In contrast, a chemical reaction such as the precipitation of metal hydroxide does not involve a transfer of charge. Okay? The two phenomena that controls uh, the reaction rate, of course, the first one is known as a charge transfer. Charge transfer is actually the ability to transfer charge between metals and solution. This is actually true when you see uh, metal dissolution, Fe become Fe2+. Okay. And the uh, electron is actually being transferred from anode to cathode. Okay. And it's going to be consumed at cathode to produce another type of species. This is actually mean by charge transfer. Meanwhile, mass transfer is actually the ability of the electrolyte to diffuse from bulk electrolyte to the electrode surface. So for mass transfer, as we know, this is actually the motion of ion. Okay. And if you still remember, uh, just to test you back. Uh, can someone tell me what would be the mode of mass transfer? Maria? Do you still remember? Diffusion. Diffusion. Migration. Migration. And? And... I cannot remember. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can help? The last one? Convection. Huh? Start with C. Convection. Yes, convection. Migration. How migration occurs? G to what? Nazira? Any idea? How does Influence. migration occur? Of electric field. Sorry again. Influence of electrical field. Influence of electrical field. Maddie, any anything that you want to add? How does migration occurs? Due to what? Due to electric fields. Electric field. Uh, almost. Almost. Hamda. Any idea, Hamda? Not sure? Not sure. Migration occurs due to electro static. Yeah, yeah, Electrostatic yeah. happens when you have an opposite charge. Yeah? You have like positive and negative charge. Then this will give an attraction. When you have an attraction, this actually the first mode of mass transfer that you will always see 
migration. Okay. Next one is diffusion. How diffusion occurs? Uh, this is all just to recap what we have learned in chapter one. How does diffusion occurs? Due to what? Movement of species. We have special. Yes. This is actually with regards to concentration medium. As I said earlier, when you have ions that already migrated on the surface, this will create a more saturated ions at one phase to another phase. Imagine that you have a metal or electrode. When it oxidizes or dissolves, it forms positively charged. Fe becomes Fe2+. And this is actually your electrolyte. So it will attract negatively charged species. So this is where electrostatic happens. Okay. All right. And then when the surface now becomes that, okay, at this region, RHP, inner Hempel's plane, you have more concentration of anions. It's greater eh, over here than the other species, normally like a bigger species, eh? will be diffused, okay, to go, okay, or to at least approach to this uh, region. Okay. So this is actually known as diffusion, right? Convection is not really related with two of this. It's more of like a mechanical effect. Steering. Aeration, eh, bubbling, and whatsoever. Uh, this basically when you have convection, when you have a movement of solution, okay, your solution start to mobilize, and at the same time the ions will be move as well. Uh, this is actually known as convection. I believe this diagram probably we have seen it. Um, the graphical representation. Uh, of a process occurring at electrochemical interface. You have, of course, uh, charge transfer where the electron has been produced. Okay. Then you have a mass transfer where the movement of ions occur. All right. So all the while we are talking about uh, mass transfer, right? Mass transfer due to... Um, Migration, diffusion, and also convection. Right. So there's a term that um, it is best to describe the phenomenon that occurs in the interface between metal and also electronite. Okay. The term that we are going to uh, discuss over here is known as electrochemical double layer. So what does it mean by electrochemical double layer? In chemical reaction, the rate is determined by the concentration of reactants and the temperature and will proceed at the rates that vary according to the activation energy of the reaction. In electrochemical reaction, the potential of electrified interface between the metal and solution introduce an important additional factor in which the reaction rate can be increased or decreased very significantly by changing the potential of the electrified interface. There's a tendency for charged species to be attracted or to repel from metal solution interface. This gives rise to a separation charge and the layer of the solution with different composition from bulk solution is known as electrochemical double layer. I guess all the while when I explain about this, okay, you have seen that the metals have an interaction okay, with the opposite species, and this actually creates an effect, so-called double layer effect. Yeah?
okay because you have like one layer over here and then another layer that is coming through and why it is named as electrochemical double layer because the process itself happens during electrochemical process which is why it's called as electrochemical double layer there are numbers of theoretical description of the structure of this layer including Hamhol's model Goy Chapman model and also uh, Stern model. Stern model is a combination of Hemholz and also Goy Chapman model. Okay. So this actually part uh, that you also need to memorize eh, for electrochemical double layer. Know what does it mean by electrochemical double layer? Okay. It is actually a layer of solution that is actually formed at different composition. Okay. So what does it mean by different composition from bulk solution is because if you notice, eh, over here, I have explained that in this in inner Hemholtz region, you have like more anion species after it has been migrated as compared to the outer Hemholtz region. Outer Hemholtz region is here at the bulk solution. You have less amount of uh, anion because most of it has been uh, absorbed on the surface. So as I said, we have a different models that you need to memorize. You have a Hamholz model. Is that Roy Chapman? And also Stern model. S T E R N eh? Stern model. As a result of variation of the charge separation with applied potential, the electrochemical double layer has an apparent capacitance known as double layer capacitance. It is also useful for EIS. Eh? Um, in chapter 5, we are going to learn about electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, which deals a lot with double layer capacitance. The electrokinetics are governed by the potential difference across a thin layer adjacent to the electrode surface. So this is basically the models. Eh? You have a Hamhol model, you have a Goy Chapman model, and also Stern model. Probably if you see this, you are not going to understand basically what does it mean. But I think uh, we are going to study this detail by detail. Um, this is actually the metal surface. Eh? You see over here, positive is metal surface and this is actually the electrolyte surface. This is where your counter ions eh, will be uh, forming. But more or less, if you notice over here, okay, Hempholz actually account uh, a few consideration as compared to Goy Chapman and also Stern model. So we are going to look on this. The first one is basically on Hemholtz model. Hemholtz model was developed in 1850s. It is basically a model that explains the electrostatic interaction. Earlier, we have explained that in the mode of mass transfer, we have migration. Isn't it? Okay. So when you have a migration, it is actually forming due to the electrostatic interaction. So when actually you have electrostatic interaction and the adsorption of counter ions to the other uh, opposite uh, charge will create a so-called Hamhol's model. Keywords that you need to remember is that it is actually electrostatic interaction you have to remember these keywords eh? in order to explain Hamhol's model electrostatic interaction 
to the surface. Okay. And it forms a double layer. Okay, capacitor. A little drop from the surface of outer hemos plane to the inner hemos plane. Because as I said over here, this is actually your inner hemos plane. And this region over here is OHP, outer hemos plane. All right. The linear drop is basically explain this. You have like psi. Eh? Psi uh, is more or less like um, the potential uh, values. And then x is more or less the distance, eh? uh, diffusion or the distance. So we'll see that uh, over here you have a, a linear uh, drop, which means uh, near to zero, you have a lot of, um, I think, uh, a species. You have a lot of... Uh, come to ion species and further going up okay, further uh, to the uh, outer hem region you see that it start to drop the amount is decreasing this is actually what means by the linear potential drop you have a, a potential values uh, earlier um, that is actually uh, quite high at the distance equal to zero but as you increase the distance slightly further into the um, electrode surface, okay, the potential value will be decreased because you have less amount of ions. So for Helmholtz model, it didn't account thermal motion. So what does it mean by thermal motion? Thermal motion means that anything to deal with temperature effect. Okay. As you know, if you increase, okay, or if you heat the electrolyte, what happens is the ions or the uh, particles will absorb the energy externally and it will be vibrate and it will form like a more aggressive uh, collision and whatnot. So probably uh, the interaction will be uh, occur fast. But in this case, Hempels cannot account thermal motion because it is always related with electrostatic interaction not accounting to temperature okay it is not also accounting for uh, ion diffusion okay diffusion we'll see later the other model eh? absorption onto the surface and also solve surface interaction meanwhile for go chapman uh, this is actually an improvised version because Goy Chapman actually believed that uh, the interaction between ions to the electrode surface is not basically uh, started with electrostatic can be due to directly diffusion only okay right so proposed around this year 1909 until 1930 it actually forms a flat, infinite, uniformly charged surface. Okay, flat, infinite, and uniform charged surface. You see that over here, positively charged. The blue one is actually negatively charged. It is not aligned uh, as in uh, Hamble's model. You have like electrostatic. It forms like a monolayer over here. Meanwhile, uh, over here, it is not forming like a monolayer. Maybe I should write this one layer. It forms a flat, it's just like approaching to the surface only. Okay. But uniform. Ions consider as a point charge, and Boltzmann statistical distribution uh, near to the surface. This model actually accounts thermal motion okay, because for diffusion okay, it's always like uh, the movement of ion that is being uh, pushed eh, to go to near to the inner hemisphere region IHP. Okay. then this actually accounts thermal motion now the ion concentration decrease okay but 
other things that you need to remember is that the potential value is decreasing exponentially in comparison with uh Hempel's model since all counter ions is actually absorbed on the surface making it become linear drop because you see like this more concentrated like this uh, more ions being absorbed over here so as we go further there's no more than it's like a sharp drop meanwhile for Goy Chapman since the interaction is more or less like a diffusion then um, the uh, potential decrease is more or less like exponential okay it's not a linear drop but exponential at the by length okay this is actually the distance the by length a thickness of the fusion double layer or the thickness of the equivalent plane capacitor All right and finally we have a stern model okay so stern model is actually a combination of Hemholtz and also Goy Chapman. In this case, Stone model means that it is a combination of migration plus with diffusion. This is the accepted electrochemical double layer model that we use until now. Okay? Because it's like improvised and it actually accounts both situations. The first layer is actually due to the electrostatic because we say that uh, it is due to Hemos, then the first layer okay of finite size and tightly absorbed on the surface so this actually for Hemos. oops no e yeah A subsequent layer has a point charge like in Goy Chapman. This diffusion, okay. And the slipping sharing plane at the boundary of the diffuse. Layer. So you'll see that once the Hempos region start to form over here, it will actually form a so-called a sharing plane. Okay. So the potential at the sharing plane okay, will be uh, the epsilon or the electrokinetic potential. If the shear plane and the stern plane close enough, then the potential of stern is equal to electrokinetic potential. Okay, so if shear plane and uh, stern plane is close enough, eh? so it's uh, this is actually a stern plane and this is a sharing plane. So if it is close enough, then um, the stern potential is actually equal to the electrokinetic potential. The model can deal with a specific ion absorption. Okay, and if you notice over here. Okay. the potential drop first okay it will be linear okay because this is the region where uh Hempel's model was applied and then after that you have exponential drop good boy segment because all effect the migration and diffusion are being combined together so you have like initially uh, a linear drop of potential and then after that uh, a slow exponential drop that actually accounts for diffusion all right so other variation of stern model you can have a charge reversal okay uh, charge reversal if uh, the types of anion that you use over here is a polyvalent okay a poly atoms okay? and then um, you can also have a, a stone model that is overcharged 
So this is the case where you use surfactant okay, in your electrolyte. So when you have a, elect, uh, a surfactant as your electrolyte, then uh, this will cause a so-called uh, overcharge model. But these two models is too uh, advanced for you guys to follow. It's just for your information in case of if you add a polyvalent atom and also if you add surfactant in your electrolyte. So, of course, the consequence of a double layer, the species outside Hamburg's region are too distant to react. The driving force uh, for the reaction is the potential drop across the Hamburg region rather than the potential drop across the whole double layer. And concentration at the bar is different to the concentration of the surface of the electrode. As I said, the concentration of uh, ions, eh? okay. Concentrations of ions at uh, outer Hempel's plane is not the same as the concentration of ions at the inner Hempel's plane. Right. Any questions so far for double layer? Anything that you not understand? Probably I can like just uh, ask you to summarize a bit, okay, what you have understand. Uh, Mahdi, can you actually summarize about uh, Hemholz, what you understand about Hemholz? Or probably what you understand about double layer? Yeah, Mahdi? Liana? Uh, okay, Doctor. For double layer, there are three models that we need to know. First is the Hempos model. Mm -hmm. Second is the Goy Chapman model. Chapman. Mm -hmm. Okay, the third is the Stern model. For okay. the Hempos model, it is more on the electrostatic interaction. Okay. Uh, the second is more, uh, which is a uh, Sorry, for the Hemos, electrostatic interaction, which is migration process in the mass transfer. For the Goy Chapman, is for the diffusion part. Mm -hmm. uh, and the potential drop is an in exponential decrease. Mm -hmm. For the Stern model, is the combination of Hemos and Goy Chapman. Mm -hmm. And the potential drop has two, which is the first linear, and the second is the slow exponential drop. Okay. All right. So basically, you have a few points that uh, requested uh, for uh, each model. So uh, I think if you understand what we have uh, discussed earlier on the mass transport, you can easily understand double layer model quite fast. Because as I said, the mode of mass transfer occurs First, due to migration, and migration actually result a so-called Hemholtz model, and then after that, as an effect of, um, I mean, electrostatic, you have like a saturation of uh, ions eh, on inner Hemholtz plane. Then this will create diffusion, that will account for goy chapman model, and finally, I think Stern is actually a, a summarized version of these two process that occurs together. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for that kind of I mean uh, explanation, it's okay. But things that I want to highlight again, double layer, what does it mean by double layer? Double layer, it means that a layer that is formed, okay, uh, which have a different composition. Uh, different composition here, it means that different concentration. Uh, different concentration, different potential uh, values uh, uh, that actually uh, resulted Okay, from the mass transfer process. Okay. So, any other questions so far? Apart from uh, the explanation of uh, this three model. Okay. Uh, doctor. Yeah. 
I have one question. Do we need to memorize like the potential value formula? Potential value formula, which one? This one. Uh, uh, yes. Ah, no. yes. Uh, I think uh, for your information, if you want to explain, because uh, the double A model is also one of the favorite questions that I always ask students to explain. So what you need to um, remember first is to draw eh, this interaction eh, between the metals to electrolyte interaction. Okay. The explanation, of course, if you like at least write electrostatic, you get like one point. Uh, okay. And if you explain like other things like linear potential drops and eh, uh, all this actually also give you points. In the same time, if you explain in terms of like uh, the models, eh, the, the structure, how the interaction look like, okay, using this, and also the graph of uh, potential versus uh, the distance, eh, okay, you can also get another mark, like this one. Like you have linear for Hamburg, you have uh, exponential drop for Boyd Chapman, and you have the combination of linear and exponential for Stern model. So, uh, I think the formula is no need to be memorized, but I think for the uh, models, eh, the drawings, you need to uh, at least remember. Okay? Thanks. Okay, doctor. All right. Okay, so I guess um, that's all for today. Uh, I will continue the uh, charge transfer potential, especially on the active polarization next class on uh, Thursday. So um, with that, I guess I wish you uh, the best day today. Uh, thank you for your kind attention and hopefully to see you back on Thursday. So goodbye everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Do we have the quiz on Thursday? Yeah, Thursday, Thursday, not today. Thursday, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Okay. And can corrosion control? Yes, on corrosion control, Maddie. Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor. Okay, all right. You're welcome.